Hey everyone, welcome to the Matt Report. As always, I'm your host, Matt, and today I'm joined by Thomas Griffin, author, developer of Soliloquy Slider. Thomas, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good today. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. No problem. Um, so folks who are just, uh, if you're just tuning in, where the heck have you been? But uh, uh, this is the show where I interview folks who run WordPress businesses, WordPress entre entrepreneurs, developers, designers, uh, marketers, bloggers, so on and so forth. And today I'm inviting Thomas onto the show to talk to us about what it's like to be a WordPress plugin developer, um, running the business of selling plugins and all that good stuff. So Thomas, give folks a two minute pitch of uh, what you do and who you are. Sure, uh, so my name is Thomas Griffin and uh, I graduated from college with a degree in business, but I actually started uh, my WordPress consulting business while I was in college. Uh, I was tired of not really having money. I was one of those poor college kids living on mac and cheese and ramen noodles. And uh, I decided that that wasn't fun anymore, so I got into WordPress. Uh, I found that I really loved working and developing with it. Uh, so I'd stay up late at night looking at tutorials, trying to figure out stuff through trial and error. And uh, I remember I got paid 50 bucks to fix someone's site, and I thought, man, I really like doing this. So it grew from there, and uh, so now I've been doing it about three years. I've had the privilege of working with lots of small companies to being a consultant for Fortune 500 companies. And uh, I've even created and now sell uh, what Matt has said, Soliloquy, uh, which is a uh, what I think is the best responsive WordPress slider out there. And uh, that's that's where I'm at today. Nice. Um, so were you a dev all your life growing up, were you a developer? Were you always interested in it? Or did you stumble upon this when, when, when you got to the college level? You know, I in high school we had a class, but it was... Microsoft front page, HTML, CSS. I enjoyed it, you know, but I never thought of it really as a career path. And then uh, I'd always loved computers. Though. I was always, family would call me to fix viruses or whatever. I just had a fascination with computers. I'd take them apart, put them back together. And so when I got up to college, uh, I guess it was about my sophomore year where I kind of started to get into it, uh, I found that uh, when I first started, I couldn't figure out what FTP was and what a root folder was, so I gave up for a month. Uh, but then I got back into it, and I thought, no, I really like this. I'm going to figure it out. So I spent time, got it figured out, got WordPress installed. And uh, from there, the rest, they say, is history. I just I started working on it, and I kept finding new things that I really liked. If I did something, it worked, and it was like, yeah, that's really cool. And uh, I continued to look at tutorials and grow from there. Nice. Um, yeah, a lot of folks kind of either they have been hardcore developers all their lives, they've always been coding in, in some sense, um, or they kind of found WordPress and said, you know, this is great. You know, they had their first experience like you, and that actually yeah. answers my next question. You had your first experience where somebody asked you to fix their site it was for like 50 bucks and you're for an hour and you're like, this is great. You know, I'm going to be a consultant freelancer and live the dream. Um, so that's, a, that's really awesome. Um, do you remember what that first project was, what that first client was? Uh, it was actually, so when I first started in WordPress, uh, I used the, the thesis framework, and I was in the forums trying to learn and figure out something. And uh, so I figured it out, and about a week later, uh, somebody else had an issue, and it was just, it was with their footer. Something wasn't working right with their footer. They wanted to add in some custom stuff. And uh, so they posted on the forums, like, hey, I'll pay somebody 50 bucks if they can get this fixed today. And I thought, like, all right, I've got a, you know, I had a few hours between classes or whatever the next thing I had to do. So uh, I would you know, message the person and said, yeah, I'd, I've had this issue before. I've gotten it fixed. You know, my issue is almost exactly the same. I'd be happy to fix it for you. Uh, so he gave me 50 bucks, and I think it took, like, 15, 20 minutes, and I got it finished. And uh, after that, I thought, man, you know, that's a pretty good business. I don't know how well I could do finding a, a real job getting paid that well. Yeah. And I figured, you know, if I could just find the business, and as long as I continue to improve my craft, this could really be a, a good job. So, um, That's an interesting point. You, you, I think we all, when we all start off, uh, and we we hit that first client that was that you say oh, oh you know give me the fifty bucks for uh, per hour and, and I'll fix this problem for you but it takes us like ten fifteen minutes and then we're thinking wow this is like two hundred dollars an hour this is like lawyer level is it is it always you know roses um, you know moving forward uh, to the uh, to the newbie uh, freelancer out there kind of watching this trying to get their feet uh, up and running you know definitely not I I would say I'm I'm extremely happy that happened. 
uh, because it, it pushed me into it. But that is definitely not always the case. I think, I think most of the time the case is, uh, and I think it's pretty much symptomatic for all developers that we uh, undercharge and overwork. And so it's not always the case. There are some cases where you know, like, hey, you do $100 an hour, it takes you 30 minutes, but the person just wants it done. Uh, and then there are other times where you do $100 an hour and you charge for an hour and it might take you three. Um, so it's not always the case, but I'm glad it was the case that time because yep. it really propelled me into wanting to do it. Nice. Uh, what was the aha moment uh, to start building Soliloquy and was there some uh, you know, smaller alpha version kind of spun off to Soliloquy? How, how did that all start? Yeah, so it was about uh, maybe October of 2011. Uh, I had you know, I, I was full into client work at that time. I'd done lots of, around that time, especially the uh, the fall months of that year, I got a lot of consulting for big companies. And it, they all came at one time, and they all wanted some type of slider solution. And they all wanted to be able to manage it from the back end. You know, basically, they just wanted to be able to change slides to rotate that type of thing. SEO is really important, and so they wanted to be able to do image titles, alt tags, links, link titles, all that stuff. And I kept getting frustrated because I was like, man, there's got to be a plugin out there somewhere that can do all this. And there wasn't. Either there was a plugin that eh, the interface was all right, but it didn't have any of the SEO options, or there was a plugin that had so many options, I would have to spend two or three hours trying to teach them how to use it. And so I started developing my own thing. Uh, and honestly, it was I never had any intention of selling it uh, when I first built it. I was just tired of having to do the same thing over and over again for every client. So I started to build it. I, I kept performance and stuff in mind, again, because these, these companies were SEO. They, they were big into it. So performance and SEO were basically my, my two top things, making sure that um, they were at the forefront. And so that's how I got got into making sure it was you know super fast, SEO really good, and a good interface, so I could teach them real quick. They could have it. They could figure it out. Uh, and so from there, I was sharing with a couple other consultants, and uh, they were like, "Hey, I like that. You know, can I use that?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's fine." Then I got to thinking, well, if they need it, I bet other people could find some use for it too. And so I started working to make it into a distributed product. Uh, which was interesting. I'd never made anything distributed for it, and there are a lot more variables you have to calculate. Uh, so it took about uh, about five months in total for me to to work and build it into a distributed product and get it out on the market. What were those var you mentioned the variables? What what are some of the ones that cropped up on you or popped up on you that you weren't really expecting? Yeah. So uh, a lot of stuff I had to learn about the uh, WordPress file system API. So again, not being into it a lot, there are millions, not millions, but there are lots of different file systems out there. And uh, WordPress does a pretty good job of accommodating for different file systems and different setups and making sure that um, the user that is either installing or moving files actually has permissions to do so. And that type of thing. So that was one of the first issues that I ran into, especially with the, the add-on that I put out. Um, it would require users to, to add a component. And because I didn't have any of that, I'd get, get issues with, uh, hey, why is this thing not working correctly and all that? And I'm like, well, it worked on my setup, but you know, I had to figure out working the file system API. Another was automatic updates. Since I didn't... Um, since I didn't have it distributed. I didn't really have to worry about it. I just built it for the client. If they needed something to update, I'd go in and update it. Uh, so distributed updates, having to build an API server and uh, be able to, to write in the filter in WordPress updates to create something that was good. Uh, I hooked it all into Amazon S3 to make sure it was secure. So that took a lot of time building all that out. Those were the two main things that I had to focus on and you know, just making sure it was done right uh, took a lot of time. Was there something, and those are good points, but was there something that, as a developer, uh, that you weren't expecting from the business angle? Support, pricing, um, something uh, that was just like, wow, I really wasn't expecting this, besides, of course, the, the, uh, the, the hordes of money that was coming your way. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been, 
um, extraordinarily blessed as far as support's gone. Uh, there has been minimal support from based based on what I hear other people and their support um, on plugins. Mine is minimal compared to theirs. Uh, I think part of that is a lot of time and planning to develop it. Uh, but again, I just I feel extraordinarily blessed to not have as much support as as some other people have. Um, Do you think it's because you have a lot of uh, that the, it was just built with the right amount of features, or you have great documentation? Uh, I think a lot of it came from experience with other clients. Just they kept asking for the same types of things, and so I worked to make sure that that was streamlined and easy for them to access. They would ask for specific things or, hey, this workflow doesn't work. Can we switch up this workflow? Uh, and I think that helps a lot. And, okay. and the other thing is you know, I try to spell out exactly everything that the person needs to do. If there's a button, I tell them to click here uh, you know, to try to help out people as much as possible. And so, uh, But from the business end, I think setting up the actual e-commerce solution, it was I'd done it before for like actual stores but nothing for digital. And uh, when I first started doing recurring payments, uh, so that was that was something that I didn't expect to be so I guess tough, mm -hmm. especially with a, a licensing system. That was that was tough when I first the first get it set up. Did you just do everything custom, or did you find a solution to do that? Uh, well, I started with Cart sixty six. Uh, I don't really recommend anyone. I had a lot of server issues the first of this year due directly to it. Mm -hmm. um, but the licensing system and all was completely custom. So I, I didn't really have see a solution out there. And so I wanted to build something to make sure that I wasn't supporting somebody who didn't purchase a, you know, purchase a license. Um, and so that was all custom. Mm -hmm. When you first started to say, okay, I think I really want to start selling this uh, slider plugin, um, you know, kind of like 37 Signals says, uh, were you embarrassed of version, you know, number one or version point one? Did you, were you just afraid to maybe release it uh, because it just didn't have everything you might have hoped for? Um, yes and no. Uh, part of it, uh, when I first released it, I knew there was, I knew there were some features that I wanted to add and have. Uh, I think I was, I was happy with the release. I had, had Mark um, Jaquith go through and audit it for security and things. And so I felt pretty good about, you know, as far as security went and all that. But, you know, looking back now, especially from where I'm at here, uh, there's so many things that I think, uh, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that um, to make such and such easier or it could have been faster when it first came out. Uh, you know, but that's that's just part of a product life cycle, getting out the first version and then working with feedback and continuing to improve. Nice. Yeah, they, they say if you're not embarrassed of the first version, you probably waited too long to release it. Um, you know, and I think that holds true because I think as either business guys, product guys, um, you know, I, I just have this thing like developers will never release. A pure developer would never release anything because they're just never happy. You know, they're just yeah. never happy with what of the code. Um, whereas like a product guy, the, the polar opposite might just be looking to add more features, get more feedback, and then that drags them down. You know, you just kind of find that happy medium to say, yeah, I think people yeah. can use this. That's something that I've, I've really worked at, and especially that I've struggled, I struggled with because I was nothing but a developer uh, to begin with. And that's, that's definitely a struggle. You know, as a developer, you, um, you work to please other developers. You know, that's, that's kind of your mindset. And when you start to create products, you've got to realize that there's a world outside of developers and you've got to execute. That's the biggest thing. There are so many people that can create awesome stuff, but if you can't execute, uh, it's not going to be worth anything. And in order to execute, you've got to make sacrifices mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you try your best to make sure it's, as good as possible without any bugs that you know. Uh, and then you put it out there and you work to iterate from there. Yeah. Um, when I interviewed uh, Tom McFarlane from 8-Bit, um, you know, he, one of the things that he, I always bring up in a lot of my interviews is he said developers were the, are, are the most arrogant people that he has to deal with. And it's, that, it's like that arrogance of, oh, look how good my code is. You know, it's much more optimized than your code. You know, I'm, I'm doing this with 100 less lines than you are. Um, so I think we get caught up in that, uh, especially in the tight-knit uh, community that's WordPress. Yeah, I completely agree. How did you make the connection uh, with Mark Jaquith of uh, WordPress? 
Uh, I first met him at uh, WordCamp Atlanta uh, last year. I think it was in February. It was the uh, it was the second WordCamp I'd been to. Uh, the first one that I'd gone to, I knew nothing about WordPress. It was uh, WordCamp Raleigh, and uh, I knew nothing about it. So this time coming around, I knew a little bit. I actually spoke on. Uh, it was in February, and I ended up releasing Soliloquy in March, uh, April, and so I, I spoke on the file system API and a class that I had written called a TGM Plugin Activation to help uh, plugin authors and theme authors uh, add dependencies to their themes, you know, via plugins, uh, you know, a way that users could easily go in and install and activate any plugin dependencies. And so uh, I was I was the fir- first talk in the developer track. And uh, Mark was sitting up front, and uh, I used I used a piece of code or whatever that he had written, uh, and then you know he asked some good questions. We got to talk about um, class dependencies and conflicts and things, and that so that's how we first met. And uh, from there, then I just pinged him and said, "Hey, I'm about to release this plugin. I'd love it if you could do a uh, code audit for me." And he said, "Sure," and uh, so that's kind of how we got connected. Nice. Uh, usually one of my questions later on in the interview is talking about WordCamps and WordPress community, uh, but we'll just jump into it really quick. Do you find sure. WordCamps to be uh, you know, a positive uh, a thing in your arsenal? I, I love WordCamps, um, you know, especially you know, for Soliloquy products, whatever it is. If your product is not specifically to a developer, WordCamps are where you're going to be. That's your audience. You know, That's your potential market. Those are the people... Um, that they might just be getting into WordPress, or maybe they have their own blog, and you know they're they're not interested in learning all the intricacies of WordPress. They're looking for solutions, and so if you know if you've been able to create one and it's geared toward those people, then you know WordCamp is is the place you want to be. Yep. And then apart from that, I mean, you just get to meet so many other people in the community. Uh, you get to you know you can uh, I've made great friendships. Through WordCamps, uh, you know, by by speaking, by just talk, going up and talking to people, you know, it's a great time to to get to learn about what else is going on in the WordPress community and find ways where you can help out and contribute, uh, meet other people, and so the, all the experiences I've I had at WordCamps have been wonderful. Did you? Uh, and I ask this question a lot too because a lot of people say it. A lot of developers find themselves to be introverts. Um, and when they go to these word camps, they're afraid to talk to people or they don't think people want to talk to them because they don't, they're not known in the community or they're afraid to show their code or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, have you experienced that? What, what are your recommendations to folks? Uh, yeah, so I, I've definitely experienced it um, with some developers. I, thankfully, I'm, I'm not a super introvert. I'm a, I may be about half and half. I enjoy being out with people and meeting new people. And at the same time, I enjoy having my own time. Um, but uh, there are there's some people that are just super introverted, uh, don't talk to people. And my suggestion is just uh, most other people are the same way. They're out there and they don't know who's there. They're just looking to learn about WordPress. But you've got a common ground, WordPress. Mm-hmm. Just go up and talk to them. Say, hey, my name's Thomas. You know, how are you doing? You know, what's... What's your affinity with WordPress? Are you just a business owner looking to use it to help your online marketing? Are you a developer that's you know, looking to create better websites, better code? You know, are you a high-end consultant? You know, just questions like that to get to know people. And don't be scared to go up and talk to people. Uh, you know, most most people, if you come up and speak to them, they'll you know they'll gladly engage in conversation with you. Yeah. Uh, so I actively try to do that. Any WordCamp. I mean, it helps to be uh, a speaker. Uh, you know, America kind of has a celebrity type culture. We want to be affiliated with those that that seem or appear to have some type of power or status. Uh, that definitely helps. But even if you're not, just go up and and talk to people, and uh, they're more than happy to engage in conversation with you. Yeah, no, I totally agree. For for the business folks or the blogger, small business guy listening or gal listening to this, they start hearing word camps and you know communities and stuff. Don't tune out. This is important because you're going to meet people like Thomas at these word camps or other developers that um, are going to augment your site or help you uh, yep. with a strategy or you might have a basic one-on-one question that you can ask somebody. That's a great place to do it. And you're also going to find other business owners there. Um, yeah. So definitely, definitely check that stuff yeah. out. And, you know, they've got word camps. A lot of them have, uh, have had the happiness bars. Like I think the most recent one I went to is WordCamp Chicago. 
And I love sitting up there and, you know, people just come in and say, hey, I've got this issue with WordPress or how do I do this? And just helping them out. You know, it's a great, it's a great place if you've got questions and want some one-on-one help, Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it. So uh, we kind of sidetrack or we kind of fast forwarded to to the community section, but let's take a step back to talking about the business uh, again. You launched Soliloquy first day, crickets, tons of money. How do you know? You know, I'm trying to remember about it the first day. I think, I think the first day when I launched it, I made a couple hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and I was I was ecstatic. I I didn't think I would make, but maybe I I was seriously going to be happy if I sold one license that day, and uh, I think I sold one developer and four or five single site licenses, and I couldn't believe it. I thought, uh, you know, oh my goodness, that is that is absolutely crazy. Um, that's something that I made and took time and didn't even really have intention on selling at the beginning uh, would be able to bring in some money like this. I, it opened up a, a completely new world of possibilities to me. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, I probably won't sustain this, but you know, what if, uh, what if I can sustain that? And uh, you know, it's uh, six or seven months later, and it's. Uh, sustainable nice. and I never, I never thought that I, I would get to that point uh, but but I did and uh, but yeah looking back at that first day I, I had no clue what to expect and so when that couple hundred dollars came in I remember I went out with my wife and we celebrated uh, <laughs> what I what I called a highly successful launch nice D- uh, did you what did you put in place for the launch did you have a marketing strategy a promo st- strategy media yeah. strategy what did you do I really didn't, and uh, that's something that I'm still I'm still working on. I had I had a lot of developers behind my back. You know, they'd seen the code, they knew it was good, um, they knew that I had lots of hooks and filters added in to where they could modify and use it. So I had a lot of the developer community behind me, and I, I think that's what, especially what propelled it. Uh, the first little while is uh, people would want to write reviews about it because they you know they knew it was a good product. Um, that helped. I had some people, you know, I gave away a free, free developer license to whoever wanted to review it. Uh, that definitely helped. There are a couple giveaways, you know, just to get the word out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think I maybe had a couple hundred dollars for free AdWords credits that I used. Um, and I used that. But other than that, there really wasn't any, any marketing other than Twitter developers and then people reviewing. Mm-hmm. But that's something I'm learning. Um, I'm learning about marketing now, how powerful it is and mm-hmm from a developer working to be both a developer and a marketer. It's been an interesting experience. Is there one, one thing that you're really focused on now with the marketing that, that, that's really working for you? Um, well, I, you know, with, with the issues that I had with Card66, I'd already planned a redesign, uh, which I, I thought would work a little bit better, um, and, and a pricing structure change. And uh, that got implemented back about the middle of uh, January. The site was down for about six days because uh, all the issues had trouble getting it back up. So I just spent the time, got about 10 hours of sleep in a week, and got everything redesigned and up. And it's really focused now more towards, um, you know, because I know I've got a developer community that, you know, they know the plugin's good. So now it's more of a focus on the average user. You know, so somebody who maybe doesn't use WordPress all the time uses WordPress just a little bit. Uh, how do I market towards them? You know, what's how do I get how do I get that crowd? And so that's something that I'm working on focusing on is you know to the to the average WordPress user. You know, Soliloquy is super easy to use. You can literally create a a good looking responsive slider in a minute. You know, it's fast. It's going to help you rank better in the search engine. You know, things like that mm-hmm. um, is more where I've begun to, to focus marketing on. How do you deal, and, and we brought this up, Dan and I brought this up when we were doing our uh, press this review uh, of your slider and, and other sliders. How mm-hmm. do you deal with the, with the common folk who's, who doesn't understand theming and, and template structures and they buy a, a slider and they, they think that I'm just going to install this slider and the slider will magically appear in the place that I want it. Uh, have you dealt with, with some of that before where they said, uh, where's the slider? And you have to tell them, well, you might have to put it in your theme and how do I do that? How do you yeah. do something like that? 
I, I definitely have. I've dealt with, sorry about that, snapping my finger, my dog's chewing on one of my uh, cardboard boxes right uh-huh. here. Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely dealt with that some. Uh, and, and you know, that, that was something that I knew was going to happen when I started marketing towards that type of user. You know, and it, it should be expected. You know, they, um, they may not have the same knowledge or skill set that you do, and they may expect some things, whether you explicitly state it or not, uh, about your plugin, and so yeah, one of those things is, hey, this thing isn't appearing in my header. I thought this was going to take the place of the uh, header image, and it doesn't. And and so during those times, you just have to be you know as gracious as you can and say, you know, no, this is not what it does. But here's how you can edit files to make it happen. You know, I'm all about working to empower people. You know, I don't want to. Um, you know, I want to give them solutions where possible, but if not, I want you know give them an opportunity for them to learn how to do things. You know, to if they're teachable, to teach them. So. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's a good answer. Um, twenty nine or twenty dollars, right, for the single license? Yes. Yeah. Hundred bucks for the the unlimited developer license. Where do you do you think we're charging too little in our market for 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 what's potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of of coding? That's a great question. Um, that's something that I thought about at length when I first went to to um, sell the plugin, and that's something that I still don't know. I, d- I still don't know the answer to. I think um, I definitely think themes are too cheap. I think themes should should be a lot cost a lot more, just because that's the that's your marketing, you know. That's your your marketing, your presence on uh, on the web. Um, now, whether themes could be coded better and all that, that's a different discussion. But all in all, I think themes in themselves uh, should cost more. As for plugins and things, you know, I really don't know. It depends on your audience and who you're marketing to. I remember uh, at the Pressnomics conference, the guy, the CEO from Zendesk, talking. I think he's right on, and uh, both him and uh, uh, Pete Davies from Automatic is talking about how sensitive people are to pricing, and finding that sweet spot is really tough because one price is going to isolate another, and so you've just got to find a price that's going to work for the most amount of people. And whether or not twenty and a hundred dollars works for the most amount of people, um, I don't know if I have enough data yet, mm-hmm. but. As far as what I'm charging, I feel like it's competitive. I believe it's a good deal given um, the features that are given and the speed and SEO boost. But you know, as far as whether I should be charging more or not, that's a great question. Mm. So if someone else has an answer. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Uh, well, I bring it up because you're 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 dead on with with the themes being way too cheap. I mean, if you look at somebody like an Elegant Themes, I mean, they market. They market specifically to that point, like thirty nine cents a theme. I mean, that is ridiculous, right? I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, one of the things that one of the reasons why I do this show, a lot of the people who watch this know I've got this thing about the five hundred dollar client or the five hundred dollar developer. There's the client who only wants to pay five hundred bucks for the for Facebook, and then there's the five hundred dollar uh, developer who's out there doing these services um, mm-hmm. without care of doing it well right yeah um and themes is a perfect example uh to that point did you ever think about jumping on uh, a marketplace like a theme forest uh, or code canyon to sell uh the plugin uh as far as soliloquy no uh i you know i i appreciate theme forest and code canyon their business but i mean just the reputation that they have for plugins is not something that i wanted to have with Soliloquy. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't believe that. Although I probably could have made more sales in the onset, uh, I don't think I would have achieved the same success that I have now. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because it's under its own name, it's it's its own brand, it's not um, it's not under any anything that kinda has a negative connotation Mm -hmm. in some parts of the community. And um, but as far as the look, we know. Uh, I I knew from the start that it was going to be its own thing. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I recently interviewed uh, Pippin Williamson of Pippin's Plugins, um, and one of the plugins, his first plugin was a slider as well. 
Mm -hmm. and he sold it uh, on Theme Forest, and that was a pretty good jumping, or Code Canyon, it was a pretty good jumping point for him. Um, it was a lot of traction, uh, there were a lot of eyeballs there, and he made some good sales. Then you have the recent uh, debate about uh, people who sell on Theme Forest not allowed to speak at word camps and, 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 and things like that. I don't necessarily agree with it. I think it's taking it way too far. Um, you know, Pippin, you, all the other developers that I have interviewed and designers that I've interviewed, great people. It's volunteer work, number one. Um, you're giving back to the community by, by taking part in that no matter what. Uh, and to be uh, blacklisted for having to go make a living <laughs> uh, and, and pay, the, pay the mortgage I think is a little too rough. Um, are you specific? Are you going to look at other marketplaces to join that are GPL based, or are you going to stay away from marketplaces altogether? Um, as far as uh, products that that I create, uh, I'll probably stay away from marketplaces altogether, and it's um, mainly because now that I've got one product under my belt, I've kind of got some of the first time experience of knowing what works, what doesn't, about marketing and that type of thing, and so. That at least gives me a launch pad to have a higher success rate for the next next product that I launch, whatever it might be, and and so I will probably stay away from marketplaces in that regard. And that and but that doesn't mean that uh, everybody else should stay away from marketplaces. Uh, you know, we're all created differently. We all have different makeups, different personalities. And so a marketplace may work for somebody who doesn't want to take the time to really invest in marketing and work on that because I admit it's tough. You know, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. And so that, that could be, you know, for somebody who's just looking to get something up, they've got something good, but they don't have the time to really invest in it. You know, maybe they are still wanting to stay in full time, whatever they're doing. And this might be a side project Then a marketplace might be a, a great start for them. Mm -hmm. but, you know, but as far as me, I, I'm in this 24-7. Um, now that I have the experience with Soliloquy, uh, I'll stay away from marketplaces. Great. Um, it's also one of those things, like you said, it's a branding thing. You want to keep everything under your brand. Probably a heck of a lot easier for you to support people if they're in your ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any plans for an upcoming product that you might be working on already? I do. Uh, I can't share any details. Okay. Yet, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, you'll hear more about it in March. Awesome. Um, but it's it's really exciting. I, I think it's got some awesome opportunities. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's about all I can share right now. But in March, uh, definitely there will be uh, talk about it and uh, for for the launch and that type of thing. But I'm really excited about it. I awesome. think it's got lots of great possibilities and great opportunities. That's great. Can't, can't wait to see uh, that come about. One of the questions um, that we kind of touched upon before is how do you deal with the $500 client? Um, how do you deal with the $500 client, especially somebody who thinks that they can buy your, your plugin for 20 bucks and you know, they need four or five, six hours worth of dev work just to get it to work on their theme? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when I first started, uh, I would have I would have been you know your five hundred dollar developer trying to get work and such. Uh, three years later, um, if somebody comes like that, I pass it off to someone else. Just because, uh, in general, if and it's a, I think it's a perception issue about how they view their website. People who only want to pay five hundred dollars view their website as a cost and not a uh, something that's valuable as an asset. And so I find it really hard to work uh, with that type of client because they don't see what you're doing as valuable to whatever their, their business might be. Uh, they just see it as a cost, something that they have to do. And so what I try to find, whether or not it's somebody that's uh, a couple thousand or twenty thousand dollars, is somebody who values your work. You know, their their website is important. They take time to invest in it. They see it as an asset that's going to help um, build their brand, uh, increase sales, whatever it might be. And I look for those types of clients. You know, so even if someone's two thousand dollars, but they still see it as an expense, I'll generally pass it off to somebody else because it just makes for a tough time developing. 
do you have a way to kind of weed out those clients or, or, or process that you kind of just uh, use to, to say, no, you don't understand uh, the value behind this? Yeah. Um, when I first, uh, and a lot of it's telltale kind of in the first initial, they, um, they give you an information. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, the fact that, you know, we are, I generally try to stay from, you know, we're rushed on this or behind on this and we only have such and such in a budget, you know, which tells me they don't want to invest time to make sure that something's good. Um, you have other people that you start giving them a budget and they try to nickel and dime you. Uh, I try to stay away from that uh, because it's only going to get worse as you get into the project and they actually start paying you money. So they're nickeling and diming you before you even get anything from them. Uh, that should be a red flag. Uh, those are the two things that I generally uh, are immediate to me that um, I don't really know if if we're going to fit together. Um, and then uh, those are two of the things. There's some other indicators here and there, but I think those are the two main ones that I look out for. And if I see that, I go, ah, I don't think we're going to fit well together. And Start I'll, running. Um, someone else. It, it, it's, it's something that I, I tried to... Uh, help other developers, designers understand is as soon as you start getting these red flags um, to, you know, start having to say no. We all started at that level where we had to take on mm -hmm. a few hundred dollars at 50 bucks an hour or whatever, uh, $500 client. And then we eventually have to scale ourselves up to be, to be fair to yourself and, and to the people around you. You have to understand that you want to, you want to scale. Right. You have to want to understand that. Look, I, I don't want to be stuck in this level because I don't want to be dealing with these types of clients, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. 10, 20 years. Um, you need to understand that I need to scale and how am I going to get there? So it's, it, you have to have a goal. Yeah. Um, so you've got a new product coming out or a product or service coming out in a few mm -hmm. months. Um, if you could go back in time, one year, five year, 10 years, uh, what are the key ingredients uh, that you would change in your business if you had to do it all over again? Um, I would have started this a lot sooner. <laughs> uh, if you know, if hindsight is twenty twenty, if I could have gone back, I would have started this as soon as I could. Um, about business, I definitely would have been you know at first just because I was new into it. Uh, I burned some bridges that I wish I wouldn't have. Uh, that's one thing that I tell lots of people: is don't don't burn bridges. Um, do your best to do work with integrity, and, and you know, and I always try to do that. Um, unfortunately, there were some uh, few things I didn't have. I didn't have contracts set up, and uh, some some things happened that didn't work in my favor or didn't work in their favor, and uh, some bridges got burned there, and uh, that I wish wouldn't have, because you never know where your work is going to come from, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this industry. Uh, People, word gets around, and um, and so whether good or bad, uh, thankfully, um, almost all of it has been really good. Uh, you know, all my work is referrals. I I haven't really done any marketing, uh, which I'm very thankful and grateful for. But still, uh, you never know where your work's gonna from gonna come from. Uh, one client that I had led me to get five or six Fortune 500 companies, and I didn't even know that they had contact with these people. And so, you know, it's a big thing is just, you know, don't burn bridges. And then the work that you do, do it to the best of your ability. Um, you know, you're always going to look back a year, a year later and think uh, you'll cringe at what you wrote. But at the time, you're doing it the best of your ability, to the best of your knowledge. And you have to be okay with that. Uh, so going back definitely wouldn't burn bridges, um, you know, if, if at all possible. Definitely make contracts. Um, after the first couple times where you send a website over and you don't get paid, you make contracts to make sure that you're going to get paid. And uh, do all of you all of the work on a development server. Um, I didn't do that when I first started. Got burned a few times by that. So, you know, make sure that um, if you're going to get paid and do work, that you've got, you've got the work until they make sure that they've paid you and you can send it over and that type of thing. Those are some of the few things. If I could have gone back when I first started, 
uh, I would have told myself. Mm. Um, Success is built on a stack of failures most of the time. Um, So it's all a learning experience. What kind of bridges, uh, you know, were you burning? Uh, Was it uh, just saying no to certain areas of business or was it uh, not doing business with somebody in particular? Uh, Uh, I think it, it, it was probably a part of, a lack of communication on both parts ended up in just some kind of not goodwill towards towards one another and um, maybe some bad feelings after a project um, where the bridge just kind of, it didn't get burned in a, um, in a tangible sense, but you just know that that, you know, that bridge has been burned. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of how, at least when I first started, because all I did were, were projects, that's kind of how some of the bridges got burned. Looking back, uh, again, you never know where your work's going to come from. I think a lot of it could have been alleviated with better communication, uh, which is something that I think both, or I think most developers are always going to struggle with. We, I mean, we we do this work. We like to develop. We don't necessarily like the business side of keeping contact and email and all that. And so I think that's going to happen in, in the field, regardless of how good you are at it or not. Uh, but I think just working to to keep clear lines of communication will help prevent a lot of bridges from being burned. Totally, totally agree. Um, that's awesome. So that wraps up the more formal interview. Let's jump yeah. over to uh, a segment called What's in Your Toolbox? And this is what kind of software besides WordPress uh, or hardware do you use uh, to run your everyday business? Like an Evernote, a Gmail, iPad. Uh, all right, this is this is neat. <laughs> uh, I love Gmail. Uh, I, I use Gmail for everything. I've got I've got two monitors. Um, you know, both just just Samsung 19 inch HD monitors uh, to help. Uh, I, I bought them specifically for a project. I actually had a project that required that a website be able to scale 1920 by 1080 HD, and uh, so. I didn't have any monitors, so I got a couple of them. And now that I have them, I don't know how I lived without them uh, for so long. I've got that. I've got a uh, 13-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, I think I got it in uh, 2010. You know, so it's a few years old. Uh, still runs like a like a boss. I upgraded I upgraded the RAM in it uh, eight gigs of RAM, which is the easiest thing in the world to do. I, I was always scared of like uh, if I touch something, it's going to mess it up. Yeah. Uh, it was super simple. You just pop pop the chip out, stick the other ones in. Uh, I've got, uh, as far as the iPad, I only have the first generation. And I'm working on getting another one. But I've got an iPhone 5, 4S, 4, 3S, 3, and basically all the generations of iPod Touch for you know testing out responsive websites and that type of thing when it's required. Then I've got this sweet desk. It's kind of L-shaped. Got my stuff on it. Uh, got me a scanner printer stuff. Got pictures of my wife <laughs> here. Got me, got me a chair, office, all that fun setup. As far nice. as software, I use Coda. Yep. Uh, pretty much for for everything. Uh, I, I really love it. It's got a great interface. Um, I also have Transmit as well for other things. And then I've got VMware Fusion for uh, for Windows. Whenever I need to boot up Windows and check out Internet Explorer. Uh, those are the main pieces of software that I use, um, and then obviously WordPress. So awesome, awesome. Let's uh, jump into the lightning round, where I'm going to ask you a series of quick questions. You'll have a series of quick answers. All right. Uh, the one plugin besides your own that you cannot live without. Gravity Forms. A favorite WordPress or business book. Uh, favorite WordPress or business book. Uh, the book E Myth, man, I'll tell you what, being able to scale and replicate, that's huge. Yep. E-Myth, that's a great book, recommended to everyone. Awesome. Uh, a quote you live or run your business by? A quote you live or run your business by? Uh, man, a lot of what I do is based on integrity. So, uh, again, I think the golden rule really applies, applies do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Awesome. Uh, the best business or career advice you ever received? Uh, whatever you do, have passion. Uh, that was my entrepreneurship professor, first entrepreneurship class I had. He said passion will keep you going. Passion will make you successful. And I completely agree. Yep. Whatever you do, have passion. I agree. Um, the longest a client project has ever taken? 
Seven months. Not bad. Um, if you had to switch to another CMS, what would it be and why? Uh, if I had to switch to another CMS, uh, honestly, I would probably switch languages altogether. Uh, I would switch to Ruby and do Ruby on Rails and build kind of our own CMS just because I love Ruby. I love the syntax and everything in it. Uh, so I had, But if I had to switch to another CMS, um, I would really like to try out this Statomatic. It's, uh, I think that's how you call it. It's just a static file, flat yeah. file CMS. Yep. I haven't tried it yet, but I'd love to, to get into it to see how it works. Nine out of ten developers always say they're going to build their own CMS every time <laughs> I ask. Um, who should I interview next? Who should you interview next? Oh man, that's a great. These are great questions. Um, have uh, there's a guy uh, John Turner that uh, does uh, C Prod. I think that's what it's called. He does this, the Coming Soon Pro, okay. uh, the oh, Coming yeah. Soon Pro plugin. Yep. Uh, man, he is a great guy. Really smart. Uh, he's got a great product, and uh, I think he'd be uh, a good guy to interview. Awesome. And what's the one question I didn't ask you that I should have? Uh, one question that you didn't ask that you should have. Uh, what's your favorite hobby? What is your favorite hobby? <laughs> golf. I love golf. I am a golf nut. One day I hope to be a professional golfer and make my living playing golf. Yeah, me too. But unfortunately, uh, I can't break 90, so uh, I got I got plenty of time uh, to work on that path. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. It's been an awesome interview. Um, I want to tell folks if they want to see other interviews like this, head on over to mattreport.com. If you want to know when I'm going to send out the next interview, subscribe, mattreport.com slash subscribe. It's for all people using WordPress business or development, design, otherwise. Uh, Thomas, where can people find you to say thanks? Yeah, uh, you can just head over to uh, follow me on Twitter. It, my handle is jthomasgriffin. Uh, send me a tweet. Website is thomasgriffinmedia.com. And then if you're interested in Soliloquy, uh, you can do soliloquywp.com and uh, give it a try. Awesome. Uh, we are, have been reviewing it uh, on the press this show, uh, which is over at slocumstudio.com, and it's been the, on the leading board right now um, ahead of everyone else, so it's doing, it's doing great. Yeah. Um, so, Thomas, thanks again. Thanks for doing the show. Everyone go check, check out his Matt. work. Appreciate it, Matt. Thanks again for interviewing me.